Okay, so our next speaker, as I mentioned, Ramon Baez, uh, Vice President of Customer Advocacy and former CIO at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Thank you, Al. Thanks, I appreciate it. Well, when Al invited me to this, he did not tell me I was going to follow Bob Myers. I'm a, a techie following the Warriors, you know? I mean, that is like, why didn't you just have Steph Curry here? <laughs> oh, gee whiz. But again, thank you so much. I am so pleased to be here, to be a part of the 10th. Um, this is your 10th event, right? 10th anniversary. So that, that's tremendous. And, uh, you know, Al and I got to meet earlier this year, and um, I think we met at Sundance. And then we had an opportunity where we had a channel partners all come to HPE. And I walked through this whole digital transformation discussion with the CEOs, the chief marketing officers, and the CTOs. And I think that's what caused this to happen. And when we said Napa and golf, I was all over it. Uh, but I don't get to play golf. So, but other than that, it's a wonderful place. And thank you so much for the folks that I have had an opportunity to talk to, especially at dinner last night. So, what I want to share with you is not only the, our story, the Hewlett Packard Enterprise or the HP story and how we got to where we are today as far as our journey for digital transformation, but also discussions that I've had around the world, around the world, talking to other IT leaders, CIOs, uh, multiple uh, industries on what they're doing. So um, as we go through this, you may want to think about some questions. I will uh, have opportunity to, towards the end to entertain questions, and I'd love to do that. That's usually the best part of the presentation, are your questions, and hopefully my opinions will, uh, will help. So as we all are struggling with is this whole thing, disruptive innovation, we hear it all the time. And I, I love this slide because it just shows that it's just a shattering of, of glass of how disruptive things are happening today with technology. And as we go through and, and see what companies are doing day in and day out, a matter of fact, another IPO, another cloud company uh, had an IPO today. I think it was Kupta or something like that. And, 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 and a week ago, or about a week and a half ago, Aptio finally is out there. Matter of fact, when the day Aptio did their IPO, they did not get to ring the bell because there were so many IPOs that day. And, and what that's telling us is that these new companies are starting from almost just an idea, just a thought. And because of the technology has transformed so much, the things that you all do in your own companies, but what's happening for these folks that are coming up with the ideas that technology is no longer this major capital asset, this capital expenditure. And they're able to start and do things like we would never seen before. I'm going to share with you some names that I know you know, but I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you know them. But if you think about Uber, they're the largest taxi company on the planet and own no cars. If you think about Facebook, they're the largest media company, probably the most popular media company around the planet, but they own no content. Itzy, I don't know if you've heard of Itzy, but it's a big craft online thing. I know um, I have some friends that actually sell goods on this particular site. But it's the largest craft retailer and owns no inventory. And then Airbnb. Just what happened in the last year? Marriott, Weston came together and how they have communicated what they are is they're the largest branded hospitality company on the planet. But the largest hotel, if you will, is Airbnb. Marriott and Weston, who they've been in business for many, many years, is approximately 1.3 million rooms. Airbnb has already surpassed 2 million rooms and they've only been around six years. And there's this other company called Kiva, who we work with at HP, with our HPE Foundation, 
where what they do is they come to people and say, give us your money so we can loan money to people all around the planet that are trying to start a farm or start to try to build a well or start a store. And they already have assets of $715 million and they own no bank and they loan money all around the world. But the only way they're able to do that, a matter of fact, all these companies is because of this disruptive technology, disruptive innovation that has taken place in the last few years. And mobile plays a big part of that. But what we do in the background of what we have hybrid clouds or full blown public clouds, they've allowed companies to take an idea to an execution faster than we've ever seen before. So some of the bold predictions that are out there, um, IDC has shared these with us and, and we shared this at our last Discover conference. But over 60% of companies are just getting started on their digital transformation. Now, think about what that means. That means 40% haven't even started. And your companies, your competition is in some garage somewhere using technology that you probably should be using, but because of you have all this legacy stuff, they're gonna probably beat you. They're probably gonna beat you from a competitive standpoint. So think about the companies that haven't even thought about what they're gonna do to work with their CEOs, their COOs, on improving the operation. By 2020, 50% of the apps will incorporate Cognitive. What's been in the news this whole week? We have Dreamforce going on in San Francisco. Uh, Benioff's talking about AI. And if you look at the statistics in AI, today it's about a $1.5 billion market. Today. What they're saying by 2020, it's going to be a $17 billion market. So it's growing at this rapid rate. IoT. The IoT market will reach investments of 1.7 trillion by 2020. I mean, that's just phenomenal that it's growing so rapidly. And that's why you see now Kim Stevenson, a great friend of mine, she was the CIO of Intel, is now running the IoT strategy as a COO for that particular business. Basque Ayer, the CIO of VMware, he has now taken over their IoT strategy. So what you're finding is your colleagues out there are thinking, wow, maybe I should be the person that in my company to go drive this. And I'm just throwing ideas at you because these are the things that are happening today. Mobile applications, downloads to hit 284 billion by 2020. Look at your smartphone. Do you have a billion apps on your smartphone? And in reality, how many do you really use? Now, I have way too many apps, and you guys sent me another one for this conference, but I'll keep it forever because I love it, right? <laughs> but all this stuff that, we just, that I just shared with you is some people call it the concept of digital industry or uh, digital industry 4.0 or the Internet of Things, or we called it the idea economy is what we like to call it. But the problem is, are you ready for it? Are you thinking like the people I just talked about, whether it's Kim or Basque or other folks in industry that are, are leading these hyper growth companies, are you thinking that way as an IT leader? Now, I will tell you, when I started at HP in, in, on, in 2012, we were not. And that's what I'm going to share with you is the things that we were not doing that we had to do if we were going to turn the company around and really become a leader in the markets we compete in and stay as a leader in the market, markets we compete in. So when Meg came on board, um, at the end of 2011, so it was our beginning of FY 2012, she had to diagnose the problem. 
What is, what is it that we do well? And what is it that we don't do well? And how do we, the things that we do well, how do we continue to do more of that? And then how do we fix those things that are imperative and, and make the change? So FY12 was more of diagnostics, right? Really look at what we had to go do. FY13 was fix and rebuild. And, and I started um, in FY12. So we were just going through and identifying all the different things that we had to change from our company to be more focused on our customers. And, and that, I'll tell you what, when Bob was just here talking about culture, the culture that Meg was really trying to drive was that customer centricity culture. And she demonstrated that herself. And not only with customers, but with our partners. Because we do over 70% of our business through our channel partners like Dasher. And that's why being here is so important for us. And as we went through and we would try to go through recovery and expansion, we were doing well. We were integrating everything. We we're making the businesses better. We we're deploying stuff from an IT perspective as fast as we could. And then the decision was, wow, even if we do all these things, we're still too big to be this great accelerator, to be able to accelerate to a point where we will be industry leading. And that's when we needed to pause and say, you know what, we have to split these two companies. Al talked about that in his opening comments. We needed to break up and become Hewlett Packard Enterprise focused only on the enterprise, and HP Inc., which was focused on consumer as well as businesses, but more at the client level. And that made a world of difference for us to be able to operate. Both sides of the fence, they saw dramatic differences of how we could operate, and we were so different already because the HP Inc. was part of our printing and personal systems business, and it was like set free. But that's what we needed to do. So, you know, realizing that, and this is the vision statement that we have out there, we had to do some things with technology partners, um, targeted acquisitions, focused investments, and portfolio optimization. So we have this program, and I'm going to talk a little more about this later, called the Pathways Program where we have a team of folks for, in our group called Hewlett Packard Enterprise Ventures, and they go through and they identify the startups that we believe that we should do some type of partnership or maybe investment or possibly an acquisition to be a part of our company, be a part of our ecosystem. And, you know, we've already said we already do business with channel partners uh, and and uh, value-added retailers with, with already 70% of our businesses. But then we had targeted acquisitions where we acquired Aruba, and Al mentioned that earlier. And then just recently, we acquired SGI for high-performance compute and other things that they do in the big data space that will work really well in our transformational areas. And then focus investments. Even through all the stuff that we've done with the split and what we've done with some spin merging with our, what I'm going to talk about shortly, we still know that we have to focus investments in this area, whether it's composable infrastructure, uh, what we still do with hybrid cloud and everything, because that is the direction we're going. And then the portfolio optimization. We had to sell off some things, so we sold off Tipping Point, our HC3 to Tsinghua University in, uh, in China, and then the spin merge of our enterprise services, which was the old EDS, to spin off from us and now be a part of CSC, and there'll be a new company going forward, a pure play services company. And then the spin merge of our non-core software with MicroFocus, and that will occur in August of next year. And so this way, we are focused on what we're great at. I think I like what you said earlier, Al. Either uh, we're going to do things that we're really good at, and what we're not, we're going to partner. And that's the way we've looked at things, how we, our strategy going forward. We want to be nimble. We want to be fast. 
And, and, and by then, we're going to be a $28 billion company based on today's, uh, today's world. But we knew we still needed to transform. Even going through all that and we have the vision going forward, we still, from an IT perspective, we had to do things differently. Do we continue doing things from a traditional IT or do we transition more to the other side of the slide where it's more cloud enabled, mobile ready, hybrid infrastructure? And when I talk to IT leaders all around the world, everyone's in a different point in this journey. And, and what we're all trying to get away from is being this cost containment type of organization where we're really driving and creating the business outcomes that help our businesses become much more competitive going forward. Wouldn't that make you feel great when you walk away or after you do a town hall with your team that your team knows they have something to do with the bottom line? Kind of like what Bob Meyer said, well, I, I can't do anything with the stock price. You know, he was making a comment about somebody uh, saying, I, you know, I, can't, I really can't do anything about that. I've never thought that way as an IT leader. I've always thought, how can I contribute and help drive that stock price? Whether it's sharing discussions like this with customers or potential customers, or, or sitting down with our business leaders thinking, how can we get better at the things that we're not good at? And how do we fix the things that are broken from a technology perspective? And sometimes it's not even a technology thing. It may just be a process. Or maybe someone's not even aware that these problems exist. And that's how we should be thinking about this as IT leaders. This, this whole idea to become a value creator, I, I remember one of my first town halls with the um, 8,000 people that we had within IT at the time in 2012. I said, you know, I just don't want you to just be a value creator because they thought value was all about cost containment. I said, I need you guys to execute I need you to be a knowledge center in the organization. I need you to be the go-to organization so when we have customers or partners in and they want to understand how we were able to solve problems, I want the best of the best in the organization to share those ideas. And that year we had maybe 100 customer visits that came into our EBC that maybe an IT person was involved in. Within an 18-month period, we went from 100 to 1,500 visits. Then the following year, 2,000, where we were one of the most um, requested organizations to talk to our customers. And guess what? What we find in our IT organization, we usually don't have the best communicators. So they had to go through training and so forth. But what I shared with them is I don't want you being, I don't want you selling. I want you to share the practitioner's perspective of what we had to go do in our transformation. And this slide is so important from a standpoint of how do you get away from just that traditional IT to becoming this really fast, nimble, problem-solving organization? How do you accelerate the velocity of the rate of change? And that's what this idea economy is all about. So this is a super busy slide, and it's, it's somewhat blurry, so we can't let you take pictures of it and walk away and go, we, we know the secret sauce here. But that's not the intent. The intent is to be able to show you 15 years, of, approximately, of all the things that we had to go through in our transformation. And I'll try to walk you through it uh, from, from the left to the right. But at the turn of the century, there was a vice president, or no, a presidential candidate that ran our company. Her name was Carly. And her big thing was in the acquisition of Comcast. Comcast. Did I say that? No. Compact. That well, would have been cool if it was Comcast. <laughs> but Compact. And, and when that took place, we became massive. The IT organization itself was 19,000 people. I mean, that's got to blow you away. I, I lived in a little town in New Hampshire that was only 4,000 people. I mean, that, that was just insane. 19,000 people. We had over 85 data centers that were 10,000 square feet or larger around the world. Our cost was 4% of revenue. And we had over 6,000 applications. 
So we needed to reduce, we went from 85 data centers that were 10,000 square feet or bigger down to six. We went from 6,000 applications to less than 2,000 applications. We went from 19,000 people in the organization to nine. And we reduced revenue from 4% to 2%. But so what? Did we make the company better? We definitely improved the bottom line. We reduced cost. But did we become this high velocity moving organization? And the answer was no, because we were too focused on the IT metric. What we should have been focusing on is doing all those good things, which were, I'm going to tell you, was draconian. What the work that the folks did between 2005 and 2010 was just draconian. And, and it did, was a command and control. But we didn't improve our businesses. We didn't drive business outcomes. So now, fast forward to 2011, that's when Meg came on board, and we started, we came up with the MIB program, not the Men in Black, it is the Make It Better program, to actually help our businesses provide solutions to our customers, to better work with our partners going forward. But we had a problem. We talked about culture a little bit ago in, our, in the last presentation. The problem was the culture in the organization was struggling. The IT organization, because it was so draconian that it lost sight of how to work with other functions in the organization, to work with the businesses to improve. Matter of fact, when I started with the company in August of 2012, My very first meeting was a stage like this. I, 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 I was asked to go to Meg's town hall or all employees meeting to introduce myself. And right before that, there were these slides they were being presented. They're called bureaucracy buster slides. Bureaucracy busters. And I'm sitting there going, well, that's kind of cute. The BB, you know, that's how I, I start acronym because there are a lot of acronyms in HP. Even the name's an acronym. Think about it. And so I'm sitting there, and they present this slide that says the number one organization that's hated. It didn't say it that way, but this is what it depicted. The number one organization that was hated in, in all of HP, and they show a, th th a thematic analysis and clouds, and it had a big dark cloud, and the two letters IT was in the middle of it. We're a technology company, and the number one hated function in the organization was the IT group because we weren't really servicing the organization like it should, should be serviced. And I'm sitting there, and I lean over to my boss. I said, I should have asked for more money. I go, I don't know what I was thinking coming here. And he says, yeah, but you have something really good to say. I go, what? I'm introducing myself here. This is going to be horrible. They're going to throw tomatoes at me. He says, no, you have, some, you have a secret. Then he whispers in my ear what it is. And I said, oh, that's a great idea. So I get up there, and I introduce myself. And I'm shiny, probably shinier than I am right now. I'm just kind of hot and bothered. And, and at the very end, I said, oh, by the way, I have a treat for all of you. Within the next few weeks, we're going to transition you from 30 megabit, 30 megabit email boxes. Imagine that, a technology company, 30 megabit email boxes to two gigs. The crowd roared and screamed, and I was just getting all these emails. Like I was, that was the most favorite thing that an IT person could do. And I said, "Oh man, this is going to be like shooting fish in the barrel." I go, we'll just put nice Wi-Fi out there. We'll give them bigger email boxes and go from that. But it, it, they were so hungry for modern technology that I, I was able to do at other companies that I worked for. My, my teams did, of course, uh, whether it was Kimberly Clark or Fisher Scientific or Honeywell or Northrop Grumman. And to, to come to HP and see that we did all these massive things, but the things that service the people were causing such um, a dilemma. And so once we started doing that, then we also improved security. We hired a really good CISO. He came on board. 
And I know you're going to have some security discussions later today, uh, but I'll tell you, that just made a world of difference. Having somebody that looks at security from a risk management perspective versus, you know, little projects. And it was just, just amazing. And then we put our CDC on board, uh, CDC, not the uh, Center of Disease Control, but the Cyber Defense Center in Palo Alto. So all of our partners and customers can actually see them that was actually protecting us across the whole world. And now we have two CDCs, one in Ireland and one in Palo Alto, that just 24-7 is doing phenomenal work for us. And then the other thing that was just shocking for me was we did have great partnerships. We did not have great partnerships with the labs. HP Labs is just right there. And we were not working well with them. And then we became their customer zero, their first customer for a lot of new technologies. Because if it could work in our scale at that time, it's going to work for anybody's scale. So those are the things that we had to do in the 2012 time frame. And then as we continue to fast forward, um, as we thought about you know, what we need to do for our splitting the company, we needed to migrate over to the cloud. And as we built our infrastructure as a service, it improved provisioning of compute services like nobody's business. When I came on board at the beginning of 2013, I remember I was with John Henshaw, myself and my team, we were in Germany, and there was a gentleman in the front row, he raises his hand, it was the Q&A time, he says, I want to know how, when you guys are going to start giving us servers quicker. You know, and I thought, man, this guy speaks really good English for a German guy. <laughs> and just, he was blowing my, my, my mind that we're going to talk about delivering servers at a town hall meeting. And he says, I put an order in for a server and I still don't have it. And I did it two months ago. And I went, wow, do you really want a server or do you want services? He says, what do you mean? I said, well, how about if we can deploy you services within a few hours, would that make you happy? He goes, that's impossible. I said, well, okay. And in, within 90 days, we're going to have our infrastructure as a service up and running, and we're going to start deploying services, provisioning uh, what you need to do your business as a developer within four hours. Matter of fact, we're going to deploy the whole stack to you within eight hours. And we did those things. And then we started deploying databases that used to take two weeks within less than five minutes. And that's the beauty of what infrastructure as a service did for us. And then as we migrated to platform as a service, we started creating applications in a matter of days versus months and years. And then to do a change to those applications in our platform as a service, we were able to do them within minutes versus 30 to 40 days for updates. And you know, we had example after example after example. And that's what happened. We, we used the velocity program. We made, we, everything was about speed. How do we get really fast at deploying innovation? Because when you're in a turnaround, time is your enemy. And in IT, we were that turtle that Bob Myers was presenting a little while ago. We were just moving real slow. And if we got a little bit better, we, got, we started celebrating. Well, we, we needed to be a lot faster than that. And that allowed us to do some phenomenal things. Then we deployed technology business management software across the board and really got a great inventory of all of our assets across the board and what we spend on them. Why that's important, it changed the conversations with our various business units when someone wanted to hold on to their particular app, but they were the only one in the company using it, but they weren't paying for the app because we were just charging them an allocation. So there was no skin in the game, if you will, on reducing the apps. But once we changed that and went to a consumption model where we could tell people how much it costs to run an application and then say, well, if you want to pay $10 million a year for this particular app, you're the only one on it. So we're going to, that's, what, that's what the cost to run this application. And you're going to get a direct charge unless you want to move over where everyone else is on this particular app. We'll make a few changes that are critical to you. And this is now your new number. It changes the whole dialogue. And, and those are some of the things that we did to help us do a much better job 
when we came to split, when we decided to split the company up. As a matter of fact, we were moving workloads so quickly, we were able to go from six data centers down to four, and that cost savings help fund our separation of the two companies. And it's those kinds of things that people, I remember the first week I was on board, they said, you know, all we ever did was cost cutting around here, so you don't have to worry about that. And I've never had, um, I'm not gonna say who said it, so I never had a person ever tell me that in a leadership perspective that I don't have to worry about managing and reducing cost. And I'll tell you what, that made a world of difference. And why I'm telling you this is as you think through your innovation programs, you ought to be thinking about what's happening in that traditional IT set where you can reduce, take that funding, and start doing more innovative things in this new technology that will have a major positive impact on your business. So as we went through it, the, the company vision has really been simplified on these four transformational areas. And how I like to look at it is the transform pieces where a lot of companies are still there, trying to migrate to their hybrid cloud. And it's, it's actually, once you make this happen, you could start doing the other four much easier. And the re what I like about that transform area, it's all about velocity. It's all about the speed to get things done. That second transformation area, protect, protecting your digital assets are incredibly important. And the business outcome there is all about risk management. How do you help reduce the risk in your company? Whether, whether you're in healthcare, whether you're in financial services, manufacturing, everyone's coming after you. And so if you're doing this, this hybrid infrastructure, as an example, of moving a public uh, managed cloud or your own on-prem cloud, you really have to think through how are you going to protect those assets? And how do you change the culture in your organization? Because it's a people business when it comes to security. How are you going to get people to start thinking that it's their job one? And then you empower the organization to be a more data-driven organization. And I, how I like to look at that, that particular transformation area is when people are in a data-driven organization, and it, I'm not talking about just in their silo. I'm talking about across the organization where they understand how they impact the next function or the next work stream or workflow and where they can have a positive impact that starts driving profitable growth. As you grow, you start reducing the cost, and now you grow profitably. And I don't know a CEO on the planet that doesn't want to grow profitably. Who in the heck wants to grow non-profitably? And so that next piece, enablement, enablement or enabling the workforce, is making sure that your teams don't show an IT or a chart that shows IT as the most hated organization on the bureaucracy busters. Enable them to do the best they can across the board. And so that's how we look at these things, but from a business output is when you're enabling people for a business outcome is people are gonna stay. The cost to retrain people when they leave is just phenomenal. And so if you have people and you're investing in them and you're investing in the environment, they're not going to want to leave. So I, I know Bob talked a lot about culture, and I can't, cannot ag agree with him more. And I love what Peter Drucker says, is that culture eats strategy for lunch. Uh, he's the business guru out of Claremont College. And, you know, in the late 90s, everyone wanted to get to meet this, this gentleman. And, and um, Jim Collins from the book Good to Great, I remember having dinner with him one night in New York. And he was sharing the story of when he went to go uh, interview Peter Drucker. And he went to his house. And it's a nice, humble, small, little Southern California home right there on their university. And this man is the most humble person on the planet. And... and, and, and Jim Collins was just, just amazed of how much wisdom came out of him. But what I love about this, it's not just the slogan, 
It's just not a phrase. But if you put together a strategy and you don't think, the, think through the people implications, you're going to fail. Whether it's a business strategy, it's an IT strategy, if you're not thinking through how are you going to develop your teams to be ready for this massive change, whether you're communicating daily or weekly or whatever that is and making sure you're investing in your folks at all different levels in the organization, it's gonna cause you a problem. And we had that problem happen to us. We created this Jedi program, and by the way, this has nothing to do with Disney's or Star Wars. If you notice, there's two Ds in Jedi. But the, what we were trying to do here was how do we pick those attributes that would prepare our people to start dealing in this new world, going from traditional IT, that everyone's nice and siloed, where now becomes more of a DevOps environment where people have to collaborate, work, and trust people throughout the organization. We created this because what happened to us was we were going through a leadership calibration process. And we promoted several uh, people the year before that we all thought were rock stars to executive levels within the organization. Now, a year later, we're in this calibration session, and these people that were rock stars the year before are all being trashed by their leaders in the room, saying, ah, oh, they're not good enough, or blah, 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 and, you know, this person doesn't know how to communicate, or this person's not good at innovation, or this person couldn't do this, that, blah, blah, blah. And I'm sitting there in the room going, what the heck just happened? And I stood up, I said, whoa. I, and, I, and I went to the board, and it's this nine block thing. I said, everyone you've all put on the bad side of this nine block chart were rock stars last year. I'm not blaming you in the room. I'm blaming me in the room because what we did not do as a leadership team, and as me as the leader of the leadership team, we did not put a support system in for these new executives. We failed them. They didn't fail us. We failed them. And, and by the way, what we should do right now are what are the attributes that we need to help these folks stay, get back on track. And by the way, if we pick the right attributes, why don't we make these the attributes the whole organization learns? And that's exactly what we did. My HR person took it over. She brought in some reverse mentors, uh, um, millennials, into the, into the discussion. We did some gamification with this whole process, and we called it the JEDI program. Join means they join in. It's, it, we made it voluntary. It wasn't mandatory. They would join in. They would be educated. So there would be a session, and I'll explain that session in a moment. They would come back and discuss with their leader what they were going to do from what they learned to have a positive business outcome in the company and they were going to be measured on that and that's the impact now the education process for each of these is what we did was we identified the role models within the organization we didn't hire an outside trainer we didn't ask hr to be the train to the people training we said let's take the best leaders in the organization who's ever the best at continuous improvement or customer mindset or driving change and execute or innovate or collaborate or communicate and an IT acumen. Let's bring those best leaders and have them give this as a virtual classroom. And, and then what we did is we had gamification. There was competitions within the organization who had the most amount of people there. And the people that attended, they got put into a raffle and they would get fabulous prizes. That's the part of the gamification and so forth. But this had the best impact because we used the social, we used Yammer at the time, and we used Yammer to share the ideas that were coming up out of these sessions. And, and, and it just went viral within the organization. Because you had an organization of around 7,000 people at this time, it was very hard to get them all in one room uh, it was better to do it, um, and, and we would work with time, try to make it time zone friendly across the board, but then have people that they knew that were role models 
present. And it had a significant impact. And this was the first version of JEDI. We did, uh, excuse me, I believe the current CIO, Scott Spradley, uh, he's continued this program and he's doing more and more of it because it had such a big impact. But this is how we got the organization ready for what we were going to do with DevOps, what we were doing with cloud, cloudifying things and getting more into microservices and so forth, and really thinking different than what we were doing before, and having the organization work horizontally versus vertically. So now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit, and this is talking about our Pathfinders program. And, you know, it's, it's just amazing. We were the birthplace of Silicon Valley. You could go to the house in Palo Alto, California, and where Bill and Dave worked out of that garage, where they made the oscillators that they sold to Disney for the movie Fantasia, and that was the beginning of HP. That's how it all started, right there. And you can go there. But through the years, what Meg saw is we lost our way. Here, she came to the company, she thought we were very well connected in Silicon Valley, and we were not. And so we have Mark Andreessen, he's on our board, and what he suggested to Meg is, Meg, what you really need to do is let us bring in startups to meet with you so you can see what startups make sense to be, to fit in our transformational areas. And so as you can see here, the, the annual investment by VCs in, in the Valley and all over is 30 billion, 30 billion plus. And then as you go through this, you can look at the numbers, but the bottom line was we were not connected and we were in the Valley. And so we've changed that now. And so we have a group that is called the Pathfinders Program, and they actually go out and we meet with hundreds of these startups, and then we decide which ones are then gonna uh, come in and meet with Meg and the leadership team, and then we go from should we use their product, should we invest in them, should we just partner with them, or do we acquire them? And why we do this is we come up with this cur curated list of companies where if you were coming in to meet with us in these transformational areas, we would say, wow, well, the, the company that can solve that problem would be Adalom or be Mesosphere in the transform area or Link, Linker Networks as an example. And so that's what we're trying to do is make it easier for our customers and our partners to know what technology partners that we're partnering with to help our customers and our partners deal with their customers. So lastly, you know, just a couple of takeaways. The way we try to get our organization to think things really simple was, you know, how do you have an ultimate customer experience? How, you know, what, what, what do we, as we develop our products and services within the IT function, we thought about our partners and our customers of how do we make their experience with us a good experience? Because it wasn't. It wasn't a good experience for them for so long. And we had to change that. And I wanted my team to constantly be thinking about who, how do you have that customer mindset? Now I'm gonna tell you, not everyone has a customer mindset in IT. They like doing what they do, they're gonna just work hard and get it done. So you have to get that right personality that right type of person that has that fit that also can drive the change within the IT function. And then of course, you know, what are we doing to reduce costs and risks so we can throw more in the innovation bucket? That's what that's all about, is how do we innovate more? How do we do it faster? How do we have a positive impact on our company? And then of course, everything is done with high velocity, agility and flexibility. Think about what we've built in 1990s, all of us were looking at ERP systems. We're gonna, they're gonna be integrated, they're gonna be you know, industrial strength, and they're gonna be built to last. Well, that's what we did. And then it might not be the right thing. We built things to last, which is probably a good thing. That was our mindset then. But the businesses changed. The businesses needed us to change faster, and we couldn't. So instead of us being an enabler, we end up being a disabler because, well, we can't do that because the IT systems take, it costs too much to make the change to whether it's Oracle or SAP or whatever. But now, with cloud platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, 
we truly can be an enabler. And that's what that drive to agility and flexibility is all about. And then lastly, you'll get a lot of bonus points if you ever meet with your board or your executive council and you come up with ideas of how we can continue to grow profitably. So those are my golden nuggets for you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll take any questions you'd like, you have. And hopefully I'll have an opinion for you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. I was going to say, you have a basketball question for me? <laughs> <laughs> Ramon, uh, Tony Miranda here from Northwest Natural. Um, IBM is focusing on artificial intelligence and machine learning. Yes. Microsoft is doing the same. Google's doing the same. What do you see that is, uh, how big of a component is that going to be for HPE going forward? And what are some of the applications that you see coming out soon? Yeah, a great question. You know, we actually uh, had that dialogue with Martin Fink, our chief technology officer, a few years ago. Uh, when AI wasn't so popular, because you know we we were aware of Watson coming and and everyone else was looking at these things, um, you know we're going to be focused on that back end to be able to create machine machine learning and machines that are extremely fast. What we're finding is some of the things we've done with Vertica and Autonomy have done some nice things from a, a providing information rather quickly, but it's not machine learning, and. Um, I think where we're going to be in that world is we will be that back end to drive a lot of that going forward. I, I, you know, based on what I know today, now I may be wrong tomorrow. You know, there may be a now, hey, HP now just acquired, like Samsung this morning, just acquired an AI company, you know. Um, I, I, and it could change like that. But as of right now, I'm unaware of anything we're doing to create um, artificial intelligence other than in the IoT area where we're working with BMW and a few other co companies in, in the IoT area where there is machine learning taking place there. And I think that's where we're going to be is on the edges and, and so forth. But I don't see us creating a Watson or an Einstein or all those cool little things. Yes. Yes, so, John. Uh, so you mentioned about the IT transformations. So our event's been going on here 10th year now. I certainly remember 2010-ish uh, uh, speakers from HP talking about the 85 data centers down to six. And yeah. there was a lot of, uh, rightfully so, patting on the back. And we drove cost out and you know innovation. And then you mentioned how then you started to look again and, and said, maybe it's not focused so much on, on the people, on the outcomes. I guess the question is, were there a lot of shocked faces in the crowd as, as people went from the, hey, we did all this wonderful 85 down to 6 to maybe we're still missing the boat here? Was there a lot of kind of shocked or, or people in denial? I, I'm not looking for you to give all the you know, bad things, but was that, did that take some time to overcome, hey, this is how we do things and right, we should be really proud of what we've done versus there's a lot of work to be done? Yeah, that, that's, John, that's really a good question because it did, first of all, to get up on, on a stage and tell people, you know, what we did in the past, the heritage of the organization was good things. And matter of fact, it was myself, Meg, Bill Vecti, and a few other people on stage. And we had a standing room only, thousands of people in Austin, all IT folks. And one guy got up and said, hey, Meg, Ramon said, you know, he, and that, like the way he heard I said was what they did was crap. And that wasn't it at all. What I said was it was unbelievably difficult to do what you've done. The problem was it didn't make our company better. It helped us from the bottom line perspective, but that's not what they heard. What they heard was the new CIO said, well, I came in to save the day and we're going to do it this way now. You know, that, and that's what they heard and that's not what I said. So Meg looked at me you know, when I was on stage. She says, so how's that working for you, Ramon? And I said, can I try it again <laughs> since you're here? And, and really what is important in any organization as you're moving from traditional to wherever you're going is you don't forget the heritage. You don't forget how, how hard people work to get things done. But what you've got to also share with them, we're not finished. 
And this company was in the midst of a turnaround. So what I said at that time is we need to make our businesses, we have to improve how our businesses perform and we should be able to do that through IT. We're not gonna do everything, but there's things that we can do today to help them get better. Whether it's in our sales operation, whether it's our supply chain, our finance organization and so forth. And even in HR. Yes, believe it or not, we should invest in HR. So those are the things that I shared with them, but it's really tough for people to hear that because they're very proud of what they've done. And what I was trying to get people to focus on is just don't get proud. I go, I'm not going to tell you not to be proud of what you did in the past, but what I'd love for you to do is be proud of what you were about to go do and really have a positive impact on this company that desperately needs us. And so uh, it took a while for people to believe that we should be doing some of these things. And um, I remember I, to convince my IT leaders to move to a on-prem cloud for infrastructure as a service, they just thought, this is crazy. Why do you want to do this? Until we came with metrics and say, we, we're going to reduce, you know, we're going to increase the velocity of the organization by reducing the cycle time of deploying compute services. And we walked them through it. Then we demonstrated it. And then after that was done, every CIO for the business units, they all wanted to move forward. Matter of fact, they wanted to fight over it. Hi, I'm John Fagan with Superior Realty Partners. Welcome to my newest listing here at 6122 Ashburton Drive in San Jose. We're in a great location here right off Santa Teresa Boulevard, close to restaurants, shopping, and easy freeway access. The house itself is four bedrooms, two baths, over 1,800 square feet. Beautiful backyard with covered patio and built-in barbecue, stamped concrete. Let's go take a look around. <laughs>